democracy of elected officials. What would be your stance on it, and if there should be term limits? You know, I think this is one of those things where the, the voters get to decide. Um, I think that uh, one thing is for sure is that in the U.S. Senate, it's time for uh, a replacement for Sheriff Brown. And uh, I think that I'm the clear one that's uh, best positioned to do that. Uh, but that'll be up to the voters to decide. That's why we're here for the job interview. You said some pretty harsh criticism from people who said that you have been shifting positions for political expediency. I just wonder if you. Yeah, that's the campaign trail rhetoric from our opponents' camps. Listen, I've been uh, incredibly consistent when it comes to fighting for life, fighting to protect our Second Amendment, fighting for lower taxes, streamlined regulations. Those, those are the things that I've done during my eight years in the state Senate and my five years as, as Secretary of State. And that's not going to change because it's who I am. And uh, those are the same values that I'm going to take to D.C. Hi, I'm Alex. I have two questions. Alex, um, um, so, can you just talk about, it wasn't discussed tonight, but what is your position on student debt relief? Yeah, well, that'll, that'll be, I'm sure, a topic for another debate. Uh, I can tell you how I paid for my college was on the GI Bill, and uh, I think that uh, the Biden administration is attempting to subvert the you know, Congress and use uh, unconstitutional methods, executive orders, and that kind of thing. What we really ought to do is work to reduce the cost of education, to make sure that there's a whole variety of options available. If you want to go to a high cost environment and, and pay the fees that come with that, I don't think you should expect uh, to have that debt forgiven. But I think that there ought to be options available to get a high quality college education in a way that's not so high cost. And I think that we ought to be encouraging young people to go after the in-demand uh, degree programs. Listen, if you get a degree in, in gender studies or something, the gender studies factory isn't hiring these days. And so that, that's probably not gonna be a path to to career prosperity for you. But if you want to learn the trades, if you want to learn a hard skill, if you want to learn science, engineering, technology, math, that kind of thing, there's going to be great opportunities for you right here in Ohio if we're smart about it. Okay. I have another. Um, so Senator Brown does talk a lot about railway safety. So if you were elected, what would you do to ensure that something like um, what happened in East Palestine doesn't happen again to impact yet another Ohio this is a classic example of interstate commerce where the federal government should be involved. Uh, they've done, uh, we've been making some progress on things like positive train control, which is using modern technology to spot for problems, uh, sensors along the, the rails that can spot for overheating bearings. I mean, we're getting really deep into the weeds here and that kind of thing. Uh, those are the kind of things that, that we should be focused on working with the, uh, the rail providers. But listen, we need to move commerce in this country. And uh, we need to have a thriving uh, transportation sector that, that supports trucking, rail, air, maritime, and, and everything else. And uh, of course, there need to be uh, safety protocols in place. But really, uh, one of my great disappointments with the East Palestine uh, situation is that it felt like the state government was uh, was the only one at the you know coming to the fight. The federal government was not as present as they should have been. I, for one, was disappointed that President Biden didn't come to the site. Uh, he seemed to have a lot of other priorities, traveling to Ukraine, going on vacation, whatever, uh, but he didn't come to Ohio. And to my knowledge, I don't think he still has come to Ohio, to that rail site. Uh, there are lives that have been turned upside down and property values that have been deeply impacted and families that have deep health concerns. The commander in chief should be there uh, to console those individuals and to reassure them that, uh, that the federal government's gonna have their back. That hasn't happened in this case, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, there's a variety of things. We have a uh, commitment to the men and women that serve in the armed forces, and that means uh, helping them with the wounds that you can see and the wounds that you can't see. There are 22 of my fellow veterans a day who commit suicide. That's 22 too many. Uh, that means that we need to make sure that they have access to the mental health care that they need. It also means taking care of those uh, who were impacted by some bad decisions that the Biden administration made. I have friends, including people that served with me in the Special Forces, that were forced to get out of the military because they did not want to get an experimental vaccination. That, that's um, unconscionable to me. Those men and women, brave soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marine, Marines should be reinstated. Uh, and if they choose to, to get out, uh, they should have a honorable discharge. And so those are decisions that need to be reversed. 
uh, for this administration as well. But standing with our veterans is a, is a top priority. These are men and women that have a lot to contribute to society. I talk about the lifelong commitment that we take when we swear that oath to this country. We've got men and women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s getting out of the armed forces. We want them to be productive, uh, wage earners, supporting their families, contributing to society because those veterans have a lot to offer. It means that we need to support them to get the education they deserve, the health care that they deserve because of the great service they've given to this country. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Justice, from Baltimore City University. How would you encourage those about more useful college careers? Yeah, I think that uh, there are a variety of ways to, to do this. I mean, what we're talking about is uh, being uh, really cooperative between industry and education to make sure that uh, we have set up opportunities for uh, industry leaders to meet with university leaders to make sure that uh, that we've um, created the kind of in-demand uh, jobs that, uh, sorry, that we've created the kind of training programs that prepare people for those in-demand jobs. I also think that, that uh, not everybody needs to go to college. Of course, that's a great option to go for a, a two, four, or, or even advanced degree if you want to. But there are a lot of young men and women that may benefit from going into the trades. I mean, I, I think that in many cases, I think my, my plumber makes more than my lawyer does, and I think that going into the trades and learning how to, to work with your hands is an honorable profession. We need to lift those up uh, as honorable professions and encourage young people to, to pursue those as well. Last question. Uh, Israel Gold from the XY Baltimore University. Uh, you mentioned in the debate how uh, gender ideology is gripping college campuses. What do you believe is the cause of this, and do you have any plans or steps to combat that? Yeah, I think that um, it's just the sort of next evolution in the sort of LGBT uh, agenda to, to um, take away the, this basic idea that there are two genders, that, that men and women are born uh, with those genders. And, and certainly, my focus would be more on, on um, underage people. Listen, if a grown person wants to modify their body in some way, I don't understand that, but, but they should be free to, to do that. Uh, to subject, I think we're all just epically bad decision makers in our in our teen years, especially early teen years, and to uh, allow someone to subject a child to a gender transition surgery is, is um, heartless, really irresponsible. I described it as child abuse. But also when it comes to women's sports, men's sports for that matter, it's a matter of fundamental fairness. You heard me say out there, my little girls, my three daughters, could compete against the boys on the basketball court, but they shouldn't have to. The only safe and fair way for women's sports to work is for women to compete against women, for men to compete against uh, men, and, and that's just a, a bottom line fairness and safety issue, quite honestly. Thanks, everyone. Okay, appreciate it.